And this is going to be recorded. So if whoever is going to start the recording can get it started. And um, I do ask that you mute yourself if you're not one of the speakers until the end. We'll have some time for questions at the end and you can unmute yourself then. Um, Today, the people at the CFB are going to talk to us about using accessible content or creating accessible content for our course materials using the Ally method tool in Canvas. And I will go ahead and turn it over to the presenters here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Holly, it looks like you're host. So, so if you could go ahead and click record. It shows there's something. It's like we got the recording on. Good to go. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for having us uh, today. We're really excited. Um, so we are the Center for Faculty Excellence team, um, and we are here, as Sheila mentioned, to talk to you about um, accessible content creation. And um, so we're going to go ahead and start off with a couple of introductions, and then we'll talk to you a little bit about what we're going to share with you today. Uh, so we'll do some introductions, talk about some accessibility tools, accessibility best practices, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end of, of the session so that we can get some, um, you know, specific uh, questions that you might have about your particular courses. Um, but I'll start off with the introductions. I'm Chelsea Chandler. I am the director of the Center for Faculty Excellence, um, and I'm going to hand it over to Kelsey. She's on the left-hand side of my screen here. Hi, I'm Kelsey Meyer. I may know a few of you who are in here. If not, it's nice to meet you virtually. I am the senior admin in the Center for Faculty Excellence, and I'm going to pass it over to Holly. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly Barber with the Center for Faculty Excellence. I'm an instructional designer there. I've worked with a lot of you one-on-one um, -on -one and have seen you also in my workshops. Uh, so today I'll be talking about the Ally tool in Canvas a little bit and also some closed captioning best practices. So I'll pass that over to Kristen. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Heidinger. Um, I'm just going to kind of reiterate what Holly said. I know most of you in here just from workshops. I'm also an instructional designer, as Holly is. And today I'll be talking about alt text throughout the presentation. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so I don't know as many of you as Kristen and Holly and Kelsey, so I'm, I'm glad to be able to get to see a couple of faces, uh, a couple of faces I know from uh, from the AQ course, but it's it's good to see everyone. So we'll go ahead and get started today. And I did want to um, put out a disclaimer here. Um, so the CFE and accessibility services do work very close together, but we have two very different ways of approaching accessibility. So accessibility services is out there for um, students who uh, perhaps have learning differences and need some accommodations. And accessibility services kind of helps faculty members out on the back side of things where they're uh, more reactive to um, student needs and so they might uh, students might ask um, for an accommodation and then you might as a faculty member work with accessibility services to help provide that accommodation so what we're going to talk about today is more on the proactive side of things creating accessible content to begin with so that you're helping all of your students whether that whether they need accommodations or not so a lot of these practices are great for for any student who is going to be um, engaging in your course uh, most of what we're going to be talking about today is online content. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it's content that you have for an online course, but it's information content that you put into your Canvas course shell for students to access outside of class. Uh, so that's a lot of what we'll be talking about today. Oops. So we'll start off with setting the stage for accessible course design and pedagogy. Um, and thinking through our out learning outcomes, we're going to be identifying accessibility best practices for common course content types. So that's like, um, you know, PDF files and documents, PowerPoint presentations, those types of things. We'll ident identify some relevant features of the Ally LTI tool for Canvas. So if you don't know what that is, Holly's going to share with you what that is. So you'll get to learn about that today. 
And then locate additional resources related to accessibility because BGSU does have a lot of resources and they're kind of spread out all over the place. So we want to show you uh, how to locate those resources. Okay, Holly, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, so yes, I was going to talk about Ally a little bit and I'll show you some screenshots of what that looks like from the instructor side and the student side. Um, so Ally is a tool that integrates directly into Canvas. Um, it automatically checks the course materials against accessibility standards um, and it provides students with accessible alternative formats such as audio and electronic braille and it delivers guidance to instructors to improve accessibility of their course content. Um, so it will actually uh, check things like PDF documents, Word files, um, PowerPoints, and let you know what, what percentage of it is actually accessible for students. So can you go to the next slide, please? So when you're in Canvas, so in this example, we're in the files area. Um, when you're in Canvas, you may have noticed these little gauges that are different colors, could be orange, red, or green. Um, I have it circled on the slide here. Uh, so basically what those are, are the ally tools. Um, the orange or red would mean that maybe there needs to be some work done on your files that have been uploaded into Canvas, whereas the green is typically pretty good. You may still wanna go through and run an accessibility checker just to make sure, but um, these will let you know about how well your documents have um, accessibility. So if please to go to the next slide. And so what happens is when you click on that gauge or that, that little odometer, um, it will take you into Ally. So it's almost like another interface um, and it will look similar to what you see on the screen now. So on the screen that you'll see in the middle there, it's on a PowerPoint slide and there is highlighted on that slide in red what may need some work done. So in order to know what needs to be done with that, Ally will walk you through the steps of how to make this file accessible. So over on the right, you'll see it says 48%. 48% uh, shows that, that that's the total for the document that may need some work. So it's 48% accessible at this time. Um, the first item here, it shows on that red square, one out of one, that this pre presentation contains images that are missing just a description. Over on the right in the black box again, it's giving you some buttons that you can click to learn more about what that actually means and how to add descriptions. So it will walk you through the steps of how to add descriptions to an image. And then once you go through that, you can go back to the original file make your changes and then upload it right into Ally. And as long as you keep the same name of the file that you had uploaded, it will replace it in all the locations in Canvas. Okay, please go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so what that means then is that once you make your all your files accessible, you will the students will see this little A with an arrow pointing down next to uh, any documents that you may have in Canvas. So what they can do then is click on that and that will give them, please go to the next slide, Chelsea. Thank you. Um, so when they click on that A symbol, then they get this uh, pop-up box that allows them to decide if they would like to download an EPUB um, for an ebook on an iPad or other ebook readers. They can have electronic braille created if they have an electronic braille system. Uh, it creates MP3 files, so if they would like to listen to this, even if it's not for accessibility needs, other learning styles, they can listen to this in the car because um, it will read it to them. It'll create that MP3 file. Um, it also creates beeline readers and documents, or it'll create a file for immersive readers so that depending on the type of reader the student may have, um, it will create those formats for them. Okay, I think that wraps it up for my part. Are there any, or we could ask questions now or we can wait until yeah. the end. Yeah. Anybody have any questions on Ally? I guess I do have one question about, you know, the audio recording and so on. Um, much of, many of the content that we create for our courses is kind of owned by us. And I'm just wondering about 
you know, how students can share this material perhaps outside of the classroom and what the implications of that might be. So any documents you mean that are uploaded into Canvas? I mean, we have the documents uploaded into Canvas and, um, you know, it says an MP3 version for listening. I assume that's going to kind of read what's on the, the screen. And if that is my own personal material, can they share that with other people outside of the class, that audio recording and so what the audio recording would do, so it's, let's say you have a PDF file that you're sharing in Canvas. So they can actually download that PDF file and share it anyway outside of Canvas. So what this is doing is taking that PDF file and reading it for an MP3 just so that they can listen to it. Um, the MP3 file would probably be shareable in that way just because it is a file. Um, but the PDF file is already shareable if it's already uploaded into Canvas. Does that answer your question, Sheila? I, I think so. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I do have a question here. Mm -hmm. um, again, my, my name is Carlos Soto here. I am a faculty member at the School of Earth, Environment, and Society. Um, I started exploring sort of the um, ALI tool this semester because I had have a student, you know, that had some accessibility needs, and um, and I found the, the the option of creating MP3s um, out of you know that the student can create MP3s out of the files that I upload. One of the difficulties is right. Perhaps you have a 20 page um, PDF, which sort of leads instructions uh, to how to perform a series of steps on a computer program, right? Um, seeking on that file can become really tedious, at least from what I tried. Um, uh, you'll have to sort of skip, you know, and then here and then try to figure out where you are on the book, right? So if you already completed steps one through 10, um, and you stop and you want to continue, right? If you didn't mark where you are, then, you know, that might be problematic, right? Um, is there a way that, uh, that a student or me as an instructor can help the MP3 be, I don't know, like chapter tagged or, you know, page mark or something along those lines so that you don't have to spend time scrolling, you know, on the audio to try to find yourself where you need to be, specifically if you have, you know, reading issues, um, which might be one of the reasons why you need the MP3 audio to read for yourself. How, how can you get around that? Um, so, yeah, so. so one uh, thing that may be better in that situation is to use one of the readers, because that way they can start and stop the reader while they are using that file. Um, the only other way is as an instructor, if you have an MP3 file, you could possibly edit it into chunks that you could keep in Canvas, um, but that may be a little more work than you need. I mean, I would recommend using a reader for like the student that has accessibility needs in that situation. And do you mean the readers that are down below? So like the Beeline yes. reader or the Immensive reader? Okay. Yes. Yep. Or even the EPUB would pro probably work where they could then bookmark pages with the, the iPad or ebook reader. And a lot of that would depend on student systems that they're using as well. So there might be some recommendations that you could you could make to students who have particular accessibility needs that, you know, these things might be better than others because some students might gravitate more towards the MP3 version, but that might not be the best version. So that might be up to you to recommend to them. Um, but the tool itself, um, it, it doesn't offer a lot of customization because this is meant to be something from the student side of things. So once you get all of your materials to be at a baseline of accessibility, it's meant for students to be able to come in and get what they need um, at a very baseline. So this is by no means perfect. Um, so yeah, we do recognize that, but that's a good suggestion to use that reader. Heidi, you have a question? I do. Um, and this could be a very ignorant question. <laughs> Um, but one of the, in, in my Canvas shell, one of the reasons that the, the red odometer pops up a lot is that I provide, um, I, because I want to cut down on the number of textbooks that I'm assigning, I post uh, files that I scan from original source materials. And, you know, when I go in, it, it says it's 0% accessible because it's, it's, it's a scanned PDF. Um, 
how, where, what do I do? We have a section on PDFs specifically. Okay. I will tell you that PDFs are probably the most sophisticated thing to try and make accessible, especially if you're looking at original source materials, but it's not impossible. And if you do it one time, it should carry over for, you know, for the rest of your courses. So if you if you work on doing this every time you have a, a scanned PDF and, you know, remediate it, um, then you can use that same PDF file again and it'll be accessible. So Kelsey will be sharing that information a little bit later. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh -huh. This is Jake from Computer Science. Hi, Jake. Um, when we have a lot of images, a lot of them, what do I do? I'm guessing when you show the previous slide, we go back and then annotate what the images are representing. Uh, I teach computer graphics and visualization, and there are just countless uh, images that I scan from other resources and put it in. I don't think I will actually have time to annotate all those things. What should I do? So what we would recommend from like this point forward is just when you have those new files to keep that in mind that you would want to label those as you're putting them into Canvas to help. Because once I know it could be overwhelming when you have so many files in Canvas. Um, I would recommend maybe just slowly like working toward the goal of getting those uh, labeled at some point with descriptions. Uh, it will just help you because if you do end up with a student with accessibility needs, it will be required that you go in and do that anyway. And it's better to work toward that goal than to be having to do it all at once at the beginning of the semester when you find out you may have a student that needs that. But and, what, 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 what if you know, it's just not possible for me to do it, even if I'm required to do it? Let's say I was putting uh, annotation of the uh, the arrows that I put in between different images. So this arrow is from this to this. I need to annotate, right? So I did that for like 30 arrows and then I stopped because I just cannot keep doing that thing over and over. Um, what do I do there? So Jake, I would recommend um, possibly having a consultation with one of us where we can talk about um, maybe in all another way of thinking about how to represent information that doesn't require you to have those arrows. Um, the other thing that is a possibility, and Kristen will be talking about this with alt text, is that sometimes if you don't, if an image is, um, is not contributing to the context of whatever concept you're trying to teach, then it can be labeled as a decorative image and then the screen reader will skip over it. However, it sounds like your arrows are actually helping students understand what one thing goes to the next thing. So in that case, it would have to be you for accessibility purposes. If you had a student using a screen reader because they had visual impairment, um, the accessibility services would probably ask you to go through and do all of that. But as Holly said, it's not it's not um, something that like we're recommending you have done overnight. Um, moving forward, it would be a best practice. Um, but I understand that complication. And I think that I would welcome you to come have a consultation with one of us and we can maybe talk through in more detail what you know what some of those strategies could be. Okay, I'll, I'll try to see. And then since you mentioned that I will be required to do so, what if our faculty says, I don't have any student with this issue. Do I need to work on it now? So so what happens is accessibility. <laughs> so if a student comes in with a visual impairment and needs that, that's when it would be required. Um, so, so this isn't technically required at this point in time, but if a student comes in and um, you know is either colorblind or might have uh, might have low vision and they can't see what's on the screen and they're using a screen reader, in that case, they might have an accommodation that is required through accessibility services. And then at, the, at that point, accessibility services would come and talk to you or might ask you to set, set up a consultation with them for an accommodation. Okay. I'd kind of like to follow up on what, what Jake is saying. Um, in my introductory geology classes, and in fact, in all of the classes I teach, I might put a picture of something up there and ask students to describe the picture then and then interpret what that means in a geologic setting. You know, maybe I'm showing a picture of a fault and I want to know what kind of stresses generated that fault or something. 
It's certainly not a requirement to understand geology that you are able to do so, but at the same time, it's, I think, important. And I often show a lot of, you know, graphs and other visual images that I'm asking students to tell me what's going on and interpret. And I don't know how to, you know, give the student who has a visual impairment the ability to understand the material and, you know, show that they can understand the material. At the same time, it, in, many, in some cases, at least that visual component and being able to interpret it is very important. Yeah, and that's where alt text does come in um, and is helpful. Um, a, you know, with a lot of your resources now, if you're using some more modern books, they, those graphs and visual images could possibly come with their own alt text where someone has come in and described that, that um, that particular visual image. Um, so a lot of, this is a problem that anyone who works in accessibility comes, it encounters at some time. Because Sheila, as you were saying, if you're asking students to visually describe something, that's automatically a barrier for someone who has a visual impairment. So I think that our philosophy, at least with the CFE, and I'm sure with accessibility services, with these really, context specific instances, I think it would be worth having a consultation with one of us to take some time and think through, okay, what's an alternative that we could do? How could we get creative with this? Unfortunately, it's probably never going to be perfect because um, you can think of some scenarios where, you know, at the, at the baseline. So for example, for some of the programs in um, health and human services, um, you know, students have to physically be able to do manipulations with um, with patient bodies and things like that. So if someone comes in who is, um, you know, has a um, has a disability and isn't able to do that, like there are some baseline things that they just aren't able to do. However, we can rethink that with some of these visual items that are coming up in our courses through the use of alt text, which Kristen is going to be talking about here. It does get rather complicated, especially if you're teaching graduate programs where you have some really complicated graphs and visuals. Um, but that's not to say that you have to do it perfectly the first time and accessibility, just like with anything with equity and inclusion is a process and it's not ever going to be done. Um, so it's something that we're constantly going to have to be working on. Um, and none of us are going to get perfect and that's not the expectation. But um, I would say I would recommend definitely setting up a consultation if you have specific questions about um, any of the visual content that you're putting in or how you'd like to describe images, that kind of thing. I think that would be really helpful for us to be able to talk through that with you all because you all are really creative people and I know we can come up with great solutions. These are really great questions and I appreciate all of them. Laura, it looked like you unmuted your video. I wasn't sure if you had a question. Okay, great. <laughs> you just popped up on my screen, so I wasn't sure. Wonderful. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and continue on. And Kristen, this is a great segue into your writing right. useful alt text. Yeah, definitely. So um, we've provided the PowerPoint, so you all have links to the how-to guides listed on the screen here. Um, but thinking about alt text and thinking about the reason for images, conveying the context of why in an image is really the most important thing. So um, Chelsea and Holly had mentioned some reasons that folks would use a screen reader um, or that they would need alt text. I wanna add to that too, that it's not just for visual impairments. Um, we're seeing more and more students come in with anxiety, um, and, and they often request a screen reader as well. So even folks who have no visual impairments are still using some of these tools um, that are meant for folks who do have visual impairments. So keeping that in mind, um, you might come across an accommodation for a student who does not have a visual impairment, but they're still using a screen reader or some sort of assistive technology that would prompt you to use alt text. I'm um, keeping in mind that alt text is really um, what the screen reader would read in place of that image. So something concise, um, usually a system will block you when you once you get past 100 or 120 characters. So it really limits you on how you can describe that image. Something that I like to remind folks of is that alt text option is really just the basics of what you can do to provide alternative text for an image. 
in the text, you definitely want to convey the purpose of that image and describe that image. So even if you are using alt text, you're still going to want to describe that image somewhere in the body of your page or on that document. Just because 100 characters or 120 characters usually isn't enough to convey what that image is being used for. Um, something else that they had mentioned earlier too was marking an image as decorative. So we have had faculty who decide to not include images in their um, packets of information or in Canvas just because they don't want to have to go through that alt text. But you can always mark something as decorative. Um, that's going to get you past that accessibility checker and that's going to mark that as 100% if you, if you mark that as decorative. But if that image does have a purpose, if you're using that image to convey some sort of content in your class, I would definitely recommend doing alt text and then again, inserting a caption or describing that image somewhere else in the text so that that alt text isn't the only thing that the student has to rely on. Um, just a, a brief little note here that the screen readers will say image of or picture of and so that's text that you don't have to include in the alt text when you're typing that out. So that's already going to help you out character wise. But just keep in mind that that alt text is going to be limiting and we definitely recommend using a caption for, for images or providing a description of the images within that text. And I'll, I'll say too that if you've never used a screen reader yourself, um, it could be a good exercise in empathy and trying to understand what students um, who use screen readers might hear um, as they're going through, say, a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation or a PDF that you post and understand why it might be confusing for, um, you know, for, for some of these things not to be uh, in the actual uh, alt text or as I'm going to talk about in just a minute, creating documents and when screen readers read out hyperlinks, it's very confusing. Um, so if you haven't tried out one of those, um, we can, Kelsey, would you mind putting a link in the chat for just what, maybe one of the screen readers that you've used in the past? Um, many of our systems are computers, PCs and Macs come with their own screen reader. Um, and so, you know, listening to our Practicing with that or just trying something out on your own to see what it would sound like is, is a great um, a great thing to try out. JAWS, yes. Any additional questions about alt text? Oh, Carlos, I saw you unmuted. Yes, so and, and I think I heard it, but I, I think I sort of didn't, didn't quite make the connection. So let's say I have an image and I have a graph showing uh, but showing how one variable changes, you know, as a function of another, just a regular x, y with with with, with a scatter plot, um, and and then right below it, right in in text format, I actually give a brief explanation of it. Do I need to go into the alt text and type more information about it if it's already in the slide? Yeah, yeah. So I I would recommend that. Kristen, go ahead. Yeah, so any system is going to, any um, accessibility checker is going to prompt you to insert alt text if you don't have it already. So even if you're describing something in the text, which we definitely recommend, um, an uh, accessibility checker is going to look for alt text anyways. So you would have the description in your text and then the, a prompt to include alt text, which is just that 100 characters or less. So I guess you're going back. So, so if I already have the description on the actual PowerPoint slide, let's say, right? Do I? So what you're saying is I need to re-add it into the alt text again, even if it's already it, present. Yes, and it's not going to be the same description because you're not going to have room for that. So it's going to be a very simplified, short, and concise description of that picture. Whereas in the text, you would actually describe what is important and provide the context of that picture. So when the screen reader reads it for your student, they'll read that alt text first and they'll anticipate that there's going to be a more detailed explanation later on in the text that you've included. So okay. it might just be indicating that there is in fact an image here of this graph showing these couple of things like these are your two variables and then there's a description below. Okay, okay. And, and the reason I ask is because I, I did try what you mentioned before, right? And I found it a little bit redundant sometimes because it, the description may have been the same few words that I was using, right? So the, the screen reader say image of, and then it would read the alt text and then below, you know, a similar description. So at least for myself, I found it a little bit 
jarring, right? When I was hearing at the MP3 talking, it was like, well, it's reading the exact, you know, pretty much the exact same thing. Um, one is sort of more compressed than the other, but I, I don't know. I personally, right, I didn't find it that helpful, but like, obviously, I, I don't have, it, well, and obviously, but I, I don't have any, any, any limitations, you know, in my reading or my hearing. So I'm not sure how would that sort of go, you know, or, or, or transfer to a person with, with have some sort of, of disability, um, which yeah. may find it helpful. Yeah. And I think that, um, and I think that where this comes in handy is if you have to make a description that is over 100 words because you have a pretty complex image, that could be where you add that into the text. But if you're just having to put, you know, a description in both places, that's exactly the same. I would say, um, I, I would say that folks who are using screen readers are probably pretty used to that. Um, but having more information available, I think is probably better than not having that information available for them. Kristen, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that. Nope, that's it. Any other questions? Again, we'll have time at the end too. I have, I do have a question. Um, I guess I'm a little bit confused on kind of what our assumption is in terms of student ability to like, like if we're assuming like there's a visual impairment, like what is our assumption in terms of what they are able to see? Like what do we have to include the in the description because like 100 words or 100 characters like even 100 words is small right but 100 characters is like nothing right so if they can't see an image like and we only have 100 characters to describe it it's still no information about an image so that's still like having no image there is really what I am more concerned about. So like, do we not include anything about what it is, the interpretation of that? Like if I have to do like, because I teach chemistry, if I have like, or anything else that has like any sort of complex diagram, right? Here's a diagram showing the metabolism of glucose into energy. Great. Like, I mean, I don't, like, I don't know, like, they get nothing out of that. Like, that's, I guess that's my, I don't that know. Is yeah. a major and concern. I find a struggle there. Yeah. Yeah. And that would really, is, a, is an instance where you want to provide context within the rest of the text of whatever page you're working on. So that's a good example of when the alt text just isn't going to be enough to describe that image fully to that student in order to aid their learning. So then, more description is then required for that particular student or in general. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that the baseline best practice and any of our Microsoft um, software is going to prompt you for this, but the baseline is the, the question is how would you describe this object or this image to someone who is blind? And that you're going to see that come up in any of the prompts from Microsoft. Now, we would take that a step further, and, and like I shared earlier, there are many reasons that someone would use a screen reader or need that additional description, not just baseline of that student being blind or any sort of visual impairment. But your accessibility checkers and your Microsoft products are going to prompt you to write the description as if you're describing it to someone who is blind. So that's baseline. And Siobhan, there are um, a number of resources out there and um, Kelsey, you and I might be able to work on finding some like chemistry specific resources um, about best practices for describing um, like chemical diagrams and, and things like that. So this would be another one of those instances where we might be able to help you out with that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we had a, a comment that says it is often said with a lot of truth and that many acknowledge that a picture is worth a thousand words, not a hundred characters, unfortunately. Yes, yes, I agree. And, and like I said earlier, there's um, not going to be a perfect answer for any of this. Um, and it's just something that we'll be working through. Okay, and Jake put in an example here for, uh, is this one of your maps for your computer science course, Jake? Yeah, it's for the uh, devising purpose because we are currently going to work on this. Uh, it's not just the putting which arrow goes where, also location-wise, the screen reader will read it in a certain order. So I am waiting for now. <laughs> These things yeah. Are 
Yeah, and and so I know Yadwiga has a computer science background, so Yadwiga might be another good person to to talk about because she's very passionate about um, accessibility. Um, but that's something where we would probably need to think a little bit deeper about how to represent this information, just because we aren't you know subject matter experts in computer science. But I think that um, I think that there could be a way that it could be done. Um, but again, I think that working through this in consultation. Um, Kelsey, can you share what you posted in the chat? Yeah, I just posted a link to the Web AIM website. So this is Web and then AIM just stands for Accessibility in Mind. They have a lot of the resources for anything that you need to make accessible. So I included a page about alternative text, but they also have information about how to do PDF accessibility and Microsoft Word document accessibility and PowerPoint accessibility. So it's a really great resource if you have any questions about accessibility. They also have like a color contrast checker and we have links to the specific resources via Web AIM on our uh, course, uh, creating, a, <laughs> creating an accessible course link on our web page that I can include as well, but I wanted to uh, specifically point out their resources for creating useful alt text and they have um, a section about complex images and graphs creating alt text for those. And I think this is where, you know, working with someone from the CFE or an instructional designer, and if we need to pull in accessibility services too, because they're a wealth of knowledge as well um, for, you know, specific content areas, um, you know, that because all of you in your different content areas have different needs in terms of, um, you know, maybe describing visual images. And I think at that point, it, it's helpful for us to talk to you about your individual needs. So I appreciate all these examples because now we can go through and kind of look at them and be able to use those in other, in other cases and say, oh yeah, we had this one professor who did this, this, and this. So, so thank you for these examples. Any question, any additional questions? Okay, we're at about 20 minutes left here. So I'm gonna move on to creating um, accessible documents and presentations. Um, so for creating accessible documents, this is assuming that you're using Microsoft Word. Um, and I will share with you that when you're thinking through accessibility, the web version, Office 365, the Word version there, um, it is not as robust in terms of what you can do. Um, so I would recommend if you're thinking about uh, creating your documents in an accessible way, just utilizing your, your desktop app for, for doing that. Um, but the very first thing to think about that some people might not think through is uh, creating a descriptive file name. So making sure that when you are naming your files, you have something that enables students to understand what that file name is. Because if you think about what you have in Canvas and you've uploaded a file and it just shows that file name, if a student's using a screen reader and you just have a bunch of numbers and letters for that file, it's not going to make sense to the student what that is. So that's step number one. Um, next would be improving your navigation and screen reader capability by using styles. Um, and so when you are in Microsoft Office, or excuse me, Microsoft Word, and you go up to the, the ribbon up at the top of the page and you see those styles, that allows you to use a variety of different headings. Those headings can be um, formatted in any way you want. In fact, if any of you are using APA format, uh, there's a preset heading style that you can use for that. So it automatically automatically puts in headings in that way. Um, I'm not sure about other formats, but I know that one because that's the one that I use for my writing. Um, but using these headings um, is really helpful for many reasons. First of all, it organizes your document in a very um, appealing way. Also, it allows you to use the navigation panel on the left-hand side of your screen when you're using Microsoft Word. And that will allow you to be able to click through the different areas of your document. And then it also signifies to screen readers that things are nested under other things. So different content is nested in different ways and it helps the screen reader understand what order to read items in. Um, and as I said, you can create custom styles in both PC and Mac versions as well. Um, another area that's pretty typical is when you are looking at a for example, if you are going to a website and they don't use descriptive hyperlinks and instead they just type out the entire URL for folks who are not visually impaired or don't um, 
you know, have some type of learning difference, um, that can be kind of jarring to read yourself. It's just a bunch of, you know, letters and numbers strung out together. But if you're using a screen reader and that screen reader is reading that back to you, it can be pretty um, frustrating. And so instead of you just typing out URLs, we suggest that you use descriptive hyperlinks. So any of the underlined bits and pieces that you see here are descriptive hyperlinks. So that's where you can click on this link and it takes you somewhere else. And the screen reader will indicate that that is a link. Um, so you don't need to say click here on this link. All you need to do is write out what the link is and then hyperlink it either using your um, command or control K keyboard shortcut or right clicking on the tech, highlighting the text and right clicking and inserting a link there. Um, next is um, utilizing con or organizing content into accessible tables, lists, columns, and text boxes. I will say that we don't have enough time to go into each of these things here. However, each of these links is to the WebAIM uh, website, and it shows you a video tutorial on how at a base level to make each of these things accessible. Um, tables and uh, columns specifically can get rather tricky when um, screen readers are reading them, especially tables. Um, so I would highly recommend if you utilize a lot of tables in your documents or in your PowerPoint slides, taking a look at that video to understand how to make it accessible. Um, and I can tell you right now, the biggest thing to avoid is either merging or splitting cells. Screen readers do not like that. So that's like the number one thing to kind of avoid. And Kelsey earlier mentioned that there is a color checker tool to ensure that the color contrast on your document is accessible. Uh, this is a really interesting tool to play around with. Um, and unfortunately, one thing that we found out recently is that our BGSU orange and white paired together are not accessible. So you'll see that all over the place. Um, so it gets kind of tricky. So if you like to have your things customized in BGSU orange and white, it's not necessarily accessible. However, you can play around with the shading of of the, the particular colors and you can use black on orange to make that accessible. Um, but that color checker is a really great web website and all you need to do is um, find the hex code for the color that you're using, which you can do in both Microsoft Word and in PowerPoint. And we have a question in the chat here from Carlos. What would be the best practice if you also want to have, have the address visible, for instance, where the file is not used electronically. Carlos, can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean for that? So, so let's say I create a PDF, right? And, and the PDF, you know, has a set of instructions and I use the best, you know, the practice that you list here where I, where I have, you know, a hyperlink. And you, you click the word and, and it takes you to the website. But, but let's say that, you know, that that PDF could also be used and it could be printed. It could mm -hmm. be distributed. So let's say it's a flyer, right? So I can distribute the flyer digitally to people and people will be able to use the, the reader, but it's also sent out, right, uh, and, and printed out. A hyperlink will not work in that instance, right? So how would you... What is the recommendation in those instances, right? Yeah, that's a really great question. That's That's wonderful. Yeah, we can't just, like touch it with our finger and go to the hyperlink. We can't do that yet. Um, <laughs> but what I would recommend for that is if you know you're going to be printing something off or your students often print something off, um, I would still use the descriptive hyperlinks in the text if you're going to have it in Canvas. Um, but I would also recommend possibly just putting in like a resources section at the end and just maybe putting in the URL there so it's visible to folks who maybe have it printed off. So that could be a way around that. Okay, okay. So that way it's not in the main body of the text and the screen reader isn't disrupted by that URL being there. Got it. Great question. Okay. Um, the other thing that we've already talked about is creating alternative text or alt text. So I won't go over that. Um, but the the in addition to the Ally tool in Canvas, all of Microsoft's products um, for uh, the Office suite have what are called accessibility checkers. And these take you through step-by-step -step how to um, remediate a document, a um, PowerPoint to make sure that it is accessible. I will say they're not perfect. And sometimes they flag things that are already accessible. Um, so using the accessibility checker is a great way to, um, you know, kind of prior to putting your document or PowerPoint presentation 
presentation into Blackboard, or not Blackboard, we use Canvas here, sorry. Um, prior to putting that in Canvas, um, you can check the accessibility, make sure that you have all the alt text. And as you'll see here, um, thanks Siobhan, have a good day. As you'll see here, um, uh, when we get to the presentation portion of it, reading order for those PowerPoint presentations is really important. The other thing that I wanted to suggest is that if you are a person who uses Google Docs for any reason, Google Docs has a lot of these same accessibility features. They have an accessibility checker as well. Um, and I have put on, um, on this PowerPoint presentation the accessibility support page for Google. And we also do have a video tutorial that Kelsey put together on creating accessible documents. So if you need a more step-by-step -step guide on how to do that, you can take a look at Kelsey's video. So the nice thing is if you're using all Microsoft tools, a lot of the things um, that we've talked about with accessibility also apply to PowerPoint presentations as well. So using descriptive file names is the same, same idea, same notion, make sure that you're writing something that students could easily understand. Um, the, the biggest thing about uh, creating accessible PowerPoint presentations, I would say, is making sure that you're creating accessible templates from the beginning. This will save you a lot of time. If you haven't been in um, the reading order pane in PowerPoint presentations before, it can get a little bit tricky to use. And having to do that every time you create a PowerPoint presentation can be kind of, um, can, can be kind of frustrating. And so by creating a template that you know is already accessible, you don't have to worry about the reading order. And when I talk about reading order, what I mean is when a screen reader is going to go through and read a slide, for example, the slide that I have currently on the screen, if your reading order is out of order, the screen reader might read the body of the text. So for example, right here, save file images, use descriptive file names, and then it might read all of that text first and then read the heading if your reading order is out of order. So the suggestion is to um, to change the reading order in your template to make sure that your screen reader will always read the PowerPoint, um, the, the heading in the PowerPoint first and then the text. Same thing if you include images. So you, maybe you want to have that image read last. Um, so making sure that you're utilizing that reading order. And again, um, there's a video tutorial on how to create accessible templates. Again, I also point out the color checker here. And another quick tip is if you are using um, a PowerPoint presentation in your classroom, in your in-person classroom, um, we would suggest using 22 font and larger just for visual sake. So that's usually for folks who don't even have visual impairments, reading fonts that are that small at a projector screen up ahead um, can, can get rather difficult. So we have a number of comments in the, um, in the chat here. So let me take a look at these. Great, thank you, Kristen, for adding that about smart art. Jake, many faculty are not used to utilizing headings in Microsoft Word. Okay. Um, yes, Jake, that is that is something that a lot of people do. And in fact, I did that for quite some time. Um, so that if you look at the um, the video tutorial that I linked in the document here, or um, if you go to the link uh, on the CFE website about creating uh, accessible Word documents. Kelsey goes through really well in detail how to use Microsoft headings. Um, it just gets a little tricky talking through all of this stuff and providing demos at the same time because we have lots of stuff to cover in here. So I would recommend, Kelsey, would you mind putting the link to that bit? Thank you. Okay, and we're going to move over to Holly and creating useful captions. Yes, so um, I'm going to talk about some creating uh, captions for your videos. Um, one thing that is becoming really useful is the ability, ability to do auto captions. So that helps out a lot. But some of the best practices, um, you'll still want to go through those auto captions and, and check on some things that to make sure that those captions are accessible. So for example, let's say you have, you're have you going to be doing an interview with a guest speaker. Um, you're gonna have two people talking in the video. You want to definitely be sure to identify who is speaking. So either by using your names, or if it's more of a generic way you wanna describe that, you can do that with like speaker number one or narrator number one. Um, so you can alternate like descriptions, um, general or more specific by name. 
Um, also, if you have music or sound effects, which a lot of times is not recommended when you're doing educational videos because because that can be distracting. But let's say you're teaching a course in music. Um, you may have a piece of music by Bach playing. Uh, you'll want to identify the song, the artist, and if there's a specific instrument playing, uh, what that instrument is. If the tone of the or the mood of the music helps. So if it is a bouncy piece of music, you could describe it with something like that or eerie music around Halloween. A lot of times you hear that. Um, sound effects uh, should be kept in brackets. So that helps identify if there maybe is an explosion in the video, then you would put in brackets the word explosion. Um, please go to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Um, creating useful captions. Uh, also, you're going to, with the auto captions, uh, there are two ways to do that um, that you may have, uh, may want to put videos to. So in Canvas, we have Canvas Studio, and that does auto captioning. Um, and I do some workshops on that throughout the semester. And uh, there is a link, hyperlink in here too, to how to do auto captions in Canvas Studio. And then with YouTube, so if you have really long videos, uh, you may need to put your videos up in YouTube. Uh, that will do auto captions. As soon as you upload the video, it automatically does it. The one thing that you're gonna have to keep in mind though with auto captions, they're not perfect. Um, the Canvas Studio is about 85% accurate. And so you'll find like things like capitalization or punctuation may not be completely accurate. Uh, so you'll wanna go back in and edit that. Um, and then also when you use acronyms, a lot of times it's going to kind of, you know, like with BGSU, if you're saying that word, it may take that B and make it a V. So it's just going back and proofing and making sure and everything is accurate for those closed captions. Um, also, I think that's all I have for this. Um, there are links in there to how to do auto captions um, with YouTube and Canvas Studio as well. Are there any questions on captions? All right, great. You can also have um, Zoom transcribe, have the live transcripts and it'll create caption files for you. So if you happen to um, be recording one of your lectures or something like that, Zoom can also do that for you. And Holly, um, you can put that then in studio as well and on YouTube. How do those work together? Uh, well, Zoom, you would have to download the MP4. That's something to keep in mind as well. So once you download the videos from whatever you're doing auto captioning and you lose that auto captioning. So if you're downloading a video from Zoom and you did auto captioning or auto transcripts, you lose that once you do the download. So you can only view that in Zoom, um, but you could download the uh, MP4 file from Zoom and then upload it into Canvas Studio or YouTube. Um, we just recommend not putting large videos into Canvas Studio because we're sharing that space with the entire campus students and faculty, um, and we have a limited amount of space. So if you have like a two hour lecture and you want to save that, uh, we would recommend putting that into YouTube and having YouTube do the auto captions. So I think we do have about five minutes left for additional questions. At least I saw you unmuted your video. I wasn't sure if you had a question. Nope. Okay. <laughs> Just no, showing sorry, I had some bandwidth issues earlier, so no, I'm oh, good. Thank you. No worries. I, I do have a question. Um, and I'm thinking of like our geology lab right now. I don't think there's a single one that a person with a, a, a major visual impairment could do. Not a single lab in our whole our whole course, you know, requirements. And I'm thinking of someone trying to do a chemistry lab where it would be unsafe for someone with who can't see to do it. What are the limits, I guess, on wh where do you say, I'm sorry, this this is a course that requires that you be able to, to do these things versus where you have to make the accommodation so that they can so that they can do it. Um, Sheila, that's a that's a great 
example, um, uh, th that's where we would um, send you over to accessibility services to have those conversations because there are some legal ramifications that we would not be able to help with in that case. Um, and so I do acknowledge definitely that there are, there are going to be barriers for certain types of content areas or certain things that folks are going to be doing within a discipline. Um, you know, as I mentioned HHS earlier, I'm sure that there are other areas that would have that same problem. And in that case, that could be a collaboration with you and the CFE and accessibility services. I think where we come in is helping you all be proactive um, with some of this stuff so that you don't have to then go through and when you get a student with an accommodation, have to redo everything, all of your content within your Canvas course itself. And so I think that, that that's kind of where that balance lies. So I think that that would be an accessibility services question. And, and I'd just like to also say that I have taught an online class where I created, I went to all the time to create the um, written transcripts of what I was saying. And I'm the whole time thinking this is such a waste of time because nobody's ever going to use it. And guess what happened the next semester? You know, great so example. Someone, someone needed to use that. So I, I would like to thank you very much. I think this was an excellent presentation. Um, and it may have brought some traffic to your office. I know I'm going to be coming with a few figures to, to talk with you about. Um, and I thank all of you who attended. Uh, I think this is an important topic for our students to make sure that students are, are able to be successful in our courses when, when they have the ability to be successful. And um, do you have any closing words, Chelsea or anyone? I would say we would love to have you all, um, you know, coming over to the CFE and having consultations with us. We do have a consultation form on our website if you're interested in that. Um, and we have already emailed you all the, um, the PowerPoint presentation. If you need that, you can email CFE at bgsu.edu and we can certainly send it over. Sheila and Yadwiga both have the presentation and can share it there. We do have links on the CFE website.